I am so excited, finally, to get Harry here. A year ago, I watched, or maybe not even a year ago, I watched an um, interview um, with Harry and his mother, who is a congresswoman from Pennsylvania, yep. uh, Madeline Dean. Um, they were interviewed by Jake Tapper on CNN and telling their story. And immediately I said, well, I have to get them to come here. <laughs> That's just how I kind of operate. <laughs> so, um, believe it or not, I contacted him on a Friday afternoon in the summer. The man calls me at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, telling me he's not committed. And we chatted, he said, what do you want? I explained to him that I felt his story was really, really important to share. Um, I wish I had 1,400 people sitting in this room. It's, it's hard. We are recording it. I didn't tell people we were recording it because I at least wanted him to have some friendly faces to look at, some nods, some smiles, and a little bit of you know exchange. But we worked around. He thought he was going to come in the summer. He was going to weddings in Cape Cod, but that didn't work out well. And then uh, we were hoping that his mom was going to come too because your paperback book is coming out. Yep. Is it out? Well, no, it got it got postponed. This. Uh, Printing delays with okay. COVID, but All right. All coming right. soon. Right, right. <laughs> so anyway, Harry agreed. He was coming out this way anyway, doing the talk in Boston. He was up, he's been up in Maine, and fortunately, we are lucky enough to have him come to Winchester. Um, so I welcome him, and I want to welcome Mike Day, who is one of the coalition's biggest supporters with substance use and mental health. Can't say enough about him. He's always, always, always available for a phone call, which. He gets a lot of from me, and um, I'm really appreciative of the support he has given us. So, Mike, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thanks. I'm glad to hear Harry also got the dot touch, yeah. <laughs> as we've all experienced here. Um, so thanks to Dot, thanks to the Winchester Coalition, who do extraordinary work in our community and beyond. I've said it before, I often point to the coalition um, in the State House as examples of how the community can step up on its own, uh, in addition to state health and federal health. But that's uh, really driven from the from the state uh, from the local community, and the coalition is a, a huge model for us in the state. So thanks to the um, to the coalition for that, and to the high school for letting us come in here tonight. I wanted to give you just a quick update on where we are in the state, um, and to do so not so much to take a victory lap, but to say how far the state has come since I got into office. When I first started knocking doors, I would get up and I'd talk about they'd ask me why I'm running. And I talk about the mental health crisis, the opioid crisis, substance use disorder um, issues. And inevitably, three of the doors would close. We don't have that. That's not here. That's somewhere else. That's Lawrence or Lynn or Boston. And the second time I ran, the doors stayed open a little longer. And the third time I ran, people would invite me in to talk about what was going on in their, in their family. And that's a huge credit to the coalition, but it's also a credit to where we are as a state. Um, those discussions were mirrored in the state house and would have them. I talked to colleagues who would say, not in our community, those are in the, the, gate, the gateway communities. Uh, and that's become a, a sea change in there as well. We just finished the state house budget, or sorry, the house budget, the Senate's gonna go next. But I wanna give you just a quick insight as to what we're doing on mental health and substance use. Because I always say that the budget is a value statement of who we are as a people. And this one, I was particularly proud of. So uh, forgive me for the COVID glasses. My eyesight shot with all these Zooms uh, that I've been on. Um, $112.3 million for child and adolescent mental health services, which is a $14 million increase over last year's money. That's $3.8 million for mass child psychiatry access programs so that kids can get treatment. We are balancing ourselves on the head of a pin in Massachusetts in our mental health system. And people don't realize how fragile that net is right now. So we are trying to pump money into that to make sure we have the support systems necessary when families reach out for the help. Um, too often they go without. Um, we've one of the one of the pieces I was able to push through on, a, on an amendment is a study on the costs and effects of boarding individuals in our hospitals. People present with mental health crises and they are boarded in the emergency department for upwards of ten days, two weeks, and then discharged without treatment. They're boarded in our operation uh, wings. Wings that have no business taking off in children and just housing them for 10 days, 14 days, till they get their statutory limit, and then they send them back in the streets. We dealt with, which just a hospital can tell you, to the crisis that they're dealing with here. Um, it's a problem uh, to be kind. 
it is a crisis that we're in. And coming out of COVID, um, we are terrified of what's coming. We know it's coming, and we're trying to shore up the system that we have. So I'll, I'll run through a couple more, and then I'll get out of the way because I know you didn't come to listen to this. Uh, 514 million for adult mental health and support services. 20 million dollars for loan forgiveness for clinical workers. We have got a huge shortage uh, of clinical workers, and the pipeline is non-existent right now. We put in a program now that will allow social workers coming through to get loan forgiveness, debt forgiveness. Um, that's just a, a seed money that we're starting that program with so that we can get that help uh, out into our communities. Um, there are a few others that I, I won't talk about. Um, I will close um, by introducing Harry, but also saying uh, how much I admire him for his story and, and sharing that. I've said, I just talked about it a minute ago. I come from a stereotypical Irish Catholic family. I'm the six out of seven. My dad was six out of eight. Um, mom has, you know, tons of first cousins. We have every mental health affliction you can think of in our family. Alcoholism, drug addiction, anxiety, anorexia. You, have, you name it, the mental health affliction, it's in our family. And I don't say that to say that, look at us. And I don't say that we're the exception of the rule. We are the rule. And every single family in our community is dealing with this. Uh, it has, as I said, become a sea change for the better. Uh, and it's thanks to people like Harry who get out and tell their stories honestly and openly that we can actually address these types of situations and where we are as a society honestly. So with that, I will stop. Again, thanks to Dot and the Coalition. And huge thanks to Harry for what you're doing uh, and for what we're going to hear tonight and what you're going to continue to do for work. Harry, thank, thank you very much. Um, first, Dot, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad to finally be here. Dot mentioned, I remember when she, she first reached out. And, you know, for me, I just want to kind of say it, it's, it's still almost surreal, right? And I'll, I'll go into my story in a little bit, but that anybody wants to hear what I have to say. You know, because for a long time that was not the case. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for Dob for putting this on and the coalition and the representative for just shining a spotlight on this. Um, you know, something I, I like to really always kind of start with is ask people just what comes to mind when you hear the word addict or alcoholic. And I know the representative used the you know, which I think is the right language, substance use disorder or person with a substance use disorder. You know, but I think for me, when, when I think about it, though that's the right clinical term, and I think we're, we're in a change for the better on using the right language to deal with this in a less stigmatizing way, the average person, that's kind of what they're thinking of. And I'll go into my story a little bit and, and tell you, but there's times in my story where that stereotype, that image probably really fit. You know, there were times in my story, in some of my darkest moments where, you know, I, I was literally starving myself, you know, and I, and I knew that I was just unwilling to eat because all I wanted to spend my money on was drugs and all I wanted to do was do anything I could to strengthen the hot, right? So my solution to that was I don't eat every couple of days when the migraines were so bad that even opiate, opiates couldn't fix it, right? And I would go to, go to a gas station and I'd buy, in Philly we have these little cakes called Tasty Cakes, and it was 85 cents for 400 calories and that would knock out the headache. You know, so that was what my life had sort of boiled down to at times. But I want to talk a little bit about how it got there because it wasn't something that I envisioned ever happening to me and I love I'm, I'm far away from home but you know I, I'm also from an Irish Catholic family and you know my mom is the youngest of seven and you know she and I you know in our book she really talks about her family of origin and, and there's no doubt throughout the whole family I'm, I'm not the only one um, but but growing up in a lot of ways I was sort of shielded from family members and from others that that had these problems you know, and and when I grew up, I grew up sort of upper upper middle class. You know, I had a lot of opportunities. I went to a good school, and and I was really unaware of what could happen. You know, and early on, I went to the Dare program, and and my takeaway for me from the Dare program was that drugs are bad, and people who use drugs are bad. You know, so by the time that I started. 
there was already this built-in shame that I was doing something wrong, that I was doing something that was, you know, against what I believed in. Because I remember in fifth grade when I got my certificate saying I had passed DARE, I swore to myself I'm never going to do any of those things. Not going to smoke cigarettes, not going to drink, not going to do drugs. I, didn't, I couldn't even fathom what drugs were, but, but it happened so subtly, right? You know, for me at 13, I started drinking. And, and that one was pretty easy to justify because my parents, who were great people, they drank, right? And it was just an age thing. I was, was not there yet, but people that I admired and in our society and our culture, drinking is just so ingrained that we don't really think about or talk about the risks with drinking enough. Um, so it, that really seemed okay. And for me, once I sort of chipped away at that, I found that I loved the way that it made me feel. Right, because growing up, I often I was surrounded by friends. I was I was a popular kid. I had a ton of friends. I did a lot of sports. I did all sorts of things, but I always felt this little feeling of being alone, you know, or this feeling of, you know, if people really knew what was going on in my head and who I was and what I was thinking. They probably wouldn't like me, so I wanted to fit in. But when I drank, I didn't have that that thought anymore, right? I just I felt like I did fit in. You know, that anxiety, that social pressure, that fear just kind of washed away. But I realized it kind of upset my stomach. Um, and that something as simple as, you know, upset stomach made it seem okay to smoke pot. Right? Because all of a sudden that was, that was my justification at 13, 14 years old. Was I could, I could try to feel that way and my stomach wouldn't hurt. And then I realized, wait, I could maybe get away with this during school. You know, because I'm not slurring my words, it's maybe a little bit less noticeable. And and that's really for me where it started, I started using a lot was in high school. Sort of sophomore year in high school, I started smoking pot all the time. And again, I'm still telling myself I'm not gonna go further than this. I looked down and I judged people who used pills. I judged people who did cocaine at that point. And and somehow one night I got drunk and I did cocaine. You know, so it was, it was this slow progression in the beginning that, you know, I think it's just important to highlight because anybody who's been through this, I, I've met an incredible number of people who are struggling and are in recovery. Nobody wanted to end up the guy who was starving himself and eating a tasty cake every three days. You know, that wasn't my plan. But there also weren't a lot of consequences for me in school, right? I was able to hide it. The only time my mom ever knew that I was drunk and this is from through a full-blown sort of horrific couple of years was one time and I was 13 years old and she found out because all my friends got arrested for underage drinking so I had to go get picked up because I was hiding in the woods because I didn't get caught and they picked me up and they knew that I was drunk but from that day on I continued to use and and my mom could never pinpoint it right she knew something was wrong she knew something wasn't right, but, you know, she exposes, you know, through, and I learned a lot from her through reading her portions of the book that we wrote together, was part of that was a sense of denial from her perspective, right? She grew up in a family, her father was a pharmaceutical executive, you know, in the 50s, 60s was talking about mental health as a disease and schizophrenia and and these things is a disease, so she thought she had this concept of, you know, substance use disorder is a disease, but she couldn't spot it in me, right? She had blinders on because deep down she didn't want that to be the case. But I want to fast forward just a little bit to sort of what, what my senior year in high school looked like because it started to progress that way. But by senior year, I was using cocaine in school, in the bathroom, between all my classes, and was constantly high. And I was able to hide it for quite a while. And things were going well. I, I did well on my SATs. I got into 13 colleges. I got all these scholarships for academics. And I just looked at that. And I knew internally that something was going really wrong because I hated the way that I was living. And I lived in such shame. But I had people around me saying, you're doing a great job. You know, you're doing so well. And, and I used that 
to just justify continuing down the path that I was on because if I have these external things, right, and that I had learned from the drug use, I always reached for something external to try to fix a problem that was internal. Um, you know, and eventually I, I got caught in school and the school system is a little bit, uh, I think it's made incredible improvements, but when I got caught because I was high at school, you know, I got called into the dean's office and, you know, he searched me, couldn't find anything, uh, but he knew I was high, so he sent me for a drug test. And at the time, there was no offer for, hey, you should see a counselor, you should see somebody, you should talk to somebody, there might be a problem. It was just, I was met with punitive action, right? I was suspended, and I was told that if I can't pass a drug test, I'm not going to graduate. And nobody in that experience told me that, hey, maybe you need help. And I think it's so important to, to recognize that help doesn't always just mean like rehab or 30 days in treatment. You know, help can be talking to a counselor, a guidance counselor at school, a therapist, somebody, a friend, anybody. But for me, getting suspended, which, you know, is, was probably was an important step, but it just made me feel like I needed to hide it more. Because all that happened was I got in trouble. You know, and, and it reaffirmed that shame that I felt of what I was doing was wrong. But things continued to get worse, you know, and I wasn't able to stop using. And my decision was the way that I thought I would stop was I, I chose a college where none of my friends were growing. I thought it was this, this you know, my friend group, because that's what my parents always said, you know, who you hang out with, you're going to become. And, and they looked from the outside worse off than I was, even though I was right in the mix with them. You know, so I decided to go somewhere far away. I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and I didn't even make it through the first night before I got high. Um, and that was my big plan. I thought that that was going to be it. If I move, I don't have access, right? I don't know where to get it. But that first night I found somebody and we got high. And, and it really there is where I was introduced to opiates. And, and for me, once the opiates came into the picture, everything just completely started to crumble. Um, because my use just became so incredibly unmanageable and all of the, the behaviors got so much worse because I couldn't afford my habit. So I started stealing from anybody and everybody that I could find. I started lying more and that's when I was starving myself and I was paranoid and I lived this life of constant fear and hopelessness and desperation and I wanted so bad to stop using. I was 19, 20 years old, and it just continued. And when I was 20 years old, I found out that I was gonna become a father. I was seeing this girl, I was in college, we were in college together, and, and she told me that she was pregnant. You know, and I was a completely hopeless, broken, desperate, but in that moment I felt so much hope. Because I truly believed with every part of me that having a baby was going to pull me out of this. That all of a sudden, if I'm a father, my love for my daughter is going to be the thing that just stops me from using. Because I know it's wrong and I want to stop, but I can't stop. And, and what ended up happening was I dropped out of college, started working in a warehouse, and I did everything I could to try to stop using the opiates. And I put together a couple of days right before my daughter's birth, and I was able to witness her birth with a clear mind. And the first person that I texted was my best friend and my drug dealer and said, hey, man, you got to come see the baby, and we got to celebrate. And before we even left the hospital, I was in the parking garage snorting lines with my daughter up there, telling him, telling my, my friend and dealer that, hey, man, I, I quit. I stopped. I, I, I beat this thing. This is how I did it, as I'm snorting lines, believing that I had this thing figured out. But the next day, I was sneaking out of the hospital because I needed more. And for that entire year, I just, I can't even almost express the hopelessness and desperation that I lived through to know more than anything that what I'm doing is wrong, to step over my daughter to go get high. Right? And I grew up with incredible, loving, supportive parents, and here I am, 20 years old. I moved back in with my parents. I'm working a dead-end job, and I'm stepping over my daughter to go get high. And I'm justifying it, saying that if I'm in withdrawal, then I can't read her a story. I can't change her diaper. I can't take care of her if I'm so sick. So I just need to use today. If I just use today, I'll stop tomorrow. 
And I did that for a year and I tried other things during that process. And, and some of the things that I tried were I, you know, I tried to become a cop. I think, you know, if, if I'm a police officer, then I can't use, right? So I took the test, I, I passed it. I got called in by, you know, for the physical and, and of course I couldn't go because I knew I would fail the drug test. You know, so everything I had tried, I was stopped. And I, and I got to a point where I just believed that one, my daughter would have been better off without me. And I also believed that I wasn't going to survive the C25 because the people that I was around were dying and were struggling. And the people that were so innocent and just starting to experiment with me at 13, 14 years old were in a really bad spot. My closest friend, my absolute best friend, we did everything together. Um, you know, and, and one night, and it was, I wasn't there because I was with my daughter, but my closest friend, he, he was using with his girlfriend's cousin, and she died. She overdosed. And he was the one who gave her the drugs. So he got sentenced to years in prison for manslaughter, for doing the exact same stuff that I used to do. Right? But because the way that this works, and, and it's worse now than ever with the fentanyl, is it, it, you know, back 10, 12 years ago, it felt safer than it is now. You know, I was using pills and I knew that the pills were real. But like now you have no idea, it's roulette. Just that one time, it doesn't matter what, it, what you take, that's all it takes, it's that one time and that could be it. You know, but I think of that and I think about the friend group that I was with and, and I'm gonna go into my recovery in a second, but I wanna just sort of talk about the different paths right because we all started on the same path you know and he wound up in prison and and what ended up happening to me was I stole from my parents and and wound up in rehab you know and, and for me at that moment when my mom showed me all these bank statements to make it crystal clear that she knew what I was doing because I had been taking her ATM card in the middle of the night and just drained her account you know, and it was a hectic time. She was running for state rep the week before her first election to a full term as a state representative. And she couldn't pay her bills because I had drained the account. You know, and it was Tuesday, October 30th, 2012. I walked downstairs and the, our dining room table was just covered in bank statements with highlighters all over it. And I knew that everywhere on there was where I had stolen. And I knew that the first time I stole, I told myself, I'm going to pay it back. And the second time I stole, I said, I'm going to pay it all back. I just need to get my check. I got to get my check. And all of a sudden, it was this massive amount of money that I knew I could never pay back. And my mom had asked me what happened. And it was four days after my, first, my daughter's first birthday. You know, so that entire year of living in that pain of having a daughter and using... I found myself confronted with the truth of, I've got, I've got no excuse. I have nothing to say. You know, and she asked me if I, I wanted to go get help and go to treatment, and I said yes, because really more than anything in that moment, I just, I thought that seemed like the easier way out. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't think treatment would work. I didn't know anybody who was in recovery. I couldn't identify one person who had been through what I was going through and came out and found recovery. I knew friends who went to rehab and then came back to use with me again. So I didn't know if it would work, but I said yes. You know, and I got there and, and I was just so broken and so hopeless. And people started to say that, like, if you do some of these things, you got a shot. You know, and that was for me, all, all I wanted to hear was for somebody to tell me that, like, maybe, just maybe things might get better. And there was a man at the treatment center that I went to that said something to me that was one of the most powerful things I ever heard. You know, he told me, he just said, Harry, you're not a sick per or you're not a bad person trying to be good. You're a sick person trying to get well. And this guy probably told that to everybody he walked past. You know, he just caught me in the doorway <laughs> in the cafeteria, right? But he was the first person to come to me and tell me that I wasn't a bad person because for years I felt like such a bad person. You know, I felt so horrible about what I had done and the stealing and the lies and, 
and just the way that my life had turned out. He told me that I was sick, right? And, and I started to internalize that if I'm sick, maybe I can get better, right? And, and that maybe there's a reason or there's a, a treatment plan or a course of action or something that can shift the way that my life is headed. And, you know, for me, that wasn't enough. That didn't cure me, right? But it gave me a little bit enough of an open mind to start to buy in a little bit and do some of the things that they told me to do. And I learned pretty quickly when I was in treatment that there's what's called a continuum of care, right? Because I thought I was going to go for 30 days. I was going to go back home. And if I could just detox and be like physically off of the opiates, then my whole life would be fine. But I learned there that, that this is a disease, right? It's a chronic but treatable disease. And it required that I, I needed more time before I was allowed to go back home or able to go back home. And I, I continued on to a really structured, sober living environment. And it was really there for me that I started to have fun. You know, I, I started to be with other guys who are around my age and started to recognize that without using drugs, like I can laugh again. I can have fun again. Because when I first was sort of introduced to the concept that I can't use ever again, I can't drink, I can't do these things, or it's, it's going to bring me right back to where I was. I just, I thought that I was going to live this miserable, horrible life of, you know, as, as a 22-year-old, I just thought my life was going to be boring, right? Like, that, that's what it came down to. I thought I was going to live this boring life. I came from this life of sort of constant chaos and crisis and insanity to a point where it's like, now what? But what I found through being in that environment with some of those guys who were new in recovery was I met a lot of other people that had had a similar struggle. And I was seeing them show up and do the right thing. And I was seeing them that they had put together a couple months or a year. And it was through meeting other people in recovery that, that I started to see the hope that maybe it was possible. Because like I said, before I got there, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a single person that was in recovery. And that's why, for me, it's so important today to be able to try to just share my story. Right? My story is not a how-to. But my story is just to say that I'm one of more than 23 million people in this country who are in recovery. Right? There's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of different ways to find it. So when I talk about treatment, it's not because that's the only way to get to recovery. It's because that's, that's what I went through. But I went from a hopeless place to a place of hope and opportunity. And that was something that I didn't believe was possible. You know, they talked about you can have this life beyond your wildest dreams. And for me, at 22 years old, a life beyond my wildest dreams was waking up and not having to get high. That was it. I had a pretty low bar. You know, the year before I got, got into recovery, my life, you know, it wasn't like I was having fun. I was using in my parents' basement with my daughter upstairs screaming, like, thinking I'm going to die in a shootout. That was where my life was. Um, and, and that's what I was preparing for. So it wasn't this fun experience at the end. You know, so if I could just not have to get high in the morning, that was beyond my wildest dreams because I had built a life that was so narrow. But through recovery, I got introduced to people who showed me that anything's possible, right? I don't have to let that define the rest of my life. I can do, I can do something that's meaningful to me. Doesn't mean I'm going to win the lottery or like be a super rich. I'd love to, but like, you know, that, that's not what it's about. But it's about rebuilding those relationships with my parents who I devastated and put through years of torment. You know, and, and my mom and I talk about trust a lot when we do these talks together. You know, she often says she, when she went to the bank and the bank teller showed her what was going on, her thought was, can she ever trust me again? Right? Because it's a normal thought. You know, the person who's given me everything I ever needed and I'm stealing from her. You know, in the middle of the night, could she ever trust me again? And it didn't happen right away. I didn't, you know, go to treatment and all of a sudden she trusted me. It took a long time of consistently just doing little things but following through. It's an expression I love. Trust is lost in buckets and gained in drops. It's a whole lot easier to lose it than it is to build it back, but it's possible. You know, my mom and I today have an incredibly close relationship. She says I'm, I'm probably too honest with her most of the time. Uh, painfully honest with her. 
you know, and I know from sort of exposing some of the, the things that we went through in our story, you know, definitely painfully honest with her. But, but that's just one of the, the many things. So part of the way that my life has started to unfold since I've been in recovery was I was really private about it for the first few years. You know, my mom was getting into public service and I worried about her. I worried about being a liability for her. I worried about myself. Could I sustain this? You know, is this real? Everything up to that point in my life that I had, had gone for, I had failed at. You know, can I keep doing this? Can I keep going? And, and I found that just by continuing to do the things that were suggested to me and just trying to do the right thing, you know, relapse hasn't been a part of my story since October 12th or October 30th, 2012. And that's possible. You know, and that's not always the case. I have a lot of friends that, that have struggled with relapse. You know, and this is the other part that I think is critical, right? Because I talked about my friend, you know, who found himself in prison. But I had a really close friend in recovery, one of my, one of my new best friends, right? And, and we had, he had a son my daughter's age. Guy was brilliant, brilliant in recovery for a few years. He, had a, he went back to school. He got a master's. He was a therapist. And, um, and he relapsed, right? And, and I remember when that happened, thinking, like, I'm just going to be here for him, you know? And I knew he had done this, and, and I had this hope and this belief in my mind that, like, he was going to come back, you know? But I knew he was continuing to struggle, so he'd come over my house, you know, while he was struggling, and, and we'd still hang out, but it was a little bit different. We, you know, I kept a little bit more of a boundary up with him, and, um, you know, one night he went down to Philly and, and he never came home. You know, he died. He overdosed while he was driving. And I, and I, I know his family so well. I know his son so well, his ex-wife so well, his parents. And it's just like that reminder of how fragile all of this is, right? That this is, it's something that we need to just do so much about. You talked about some of the resources that are going out there, and I think that that's so critical because the budget really does show where the priorities are, right? And, and, and we're in a, a time where so many people are struggling. And as we come out of COVID, you know, but throughout COVID and before COVID, this was on the rise, right? The, the numbers were continuing to rise. And now in the last 12 months, we're over 100,000 overdose deaths, right? Like, that's horrific. But for every one of those numbers, like, I think of John, who died. But I also think of his son, his mom, his dad, his brother. That, that ripple effect of what each one of those people means to so many other people. And it's horrific. You know, but I think I, I'm here to, to just try to shine a light on the fact that, that recovery truly is possible. And the things that have happened to me through this process, right, of, of getting married, you know, falling in love with an incredible woman. I have two other kids now, a two-and-a-half-year-old and a 10-month-old. You know, my mom and I were approached to write this book. And it was not something we ever thought that we would do. It never crossed my mind. And it was probably a political liability for her to dump all of this out there. But it was something that was so important to us because if we could just share a little bit of hope, in a time that can often feel really, really hopeless, that like maybe if we can just help one person, it's worth it. You know, and it's my hope that, that we might be able to help a couple more than that. But if, it, if we can help one person to just shine a light on this and let people know that it's okay to talk about it. And I'm, I get so excited any time I have an opportunity to speak, more than anything because the fact that, that you're all here to hear and listen Right? Not because of what I have to say, but just because people are willing to engage in a conversation about a topic that can be uncomfortable and shrouded in shame and stigma and fear, and people don't want to talk about it. But when I can tell you from my experience, having written this book and told my story, the number of people that have come up to me and, and gotten vulnerable with me and opened up to me, and that doesn't even have to be about substance use. The, uh, a neighbor who, you know, he had no idea about my, 
you know, my story, and he came up and he shared something really personal. He's a, he's a guy in his, um, his early 70s, and he told me something he had never told anybody, you know, because he felt comfortable because I was willing to be vulnerable with him. And I think in this day, we just need more compassion. We need more empathy. Like our society right now is just constantly battling over these little things, and we need to meet people with empathy and compassion. You know, so I, I want to start to wrap it up because I really want to hear questions and I want to hear from all of you. But again, I, I asked in the beginning kind of what images come to mind when you hear the word or think of the word addict or alcoholic. You know, and in the beginning of my story, I, I, I usually fit that, that image. But when I look at my life today, you know, I, I worked for care and treatment centers, the same place that I had gone to get help, um, something that I never figured would be possible, something I never figured I'd want to do, let alone be possible. You know, I've got beautiful relationships with my kids, my wife, my family. I show up on time. I can pay my own bills. I'm like, I'm, I'm responsible. I mean, when I got to the treatment, I was incapable of affording food, let alone buying a house or doing these other things, which are not the reason that I do this, but it's just the, like all of those little things for me as somebody in recovery are a really big deal because of what where I came from to get there. Like I couldn't fathom paying car insurance. Couldn't fathom it. And, and to have a life that I have today where I get to design my life and do things that I want. I got to make a career change and do something for work that I was more passionate about. <clears throat> You know, is is just there's so many gifts. But again, just to end, there's you know the recent numbers are that more than 40 million Americans are struggling with a substance use or alcohol use disorder. It's an incredible number of people, right? And less than one in ten gets the treatment that they need. And again, treatment can come in a whole lot of different forms. It doesn't always mean the same thing. But we've got to do everything we can as a society to increase access to resources, right? Because no matter what's out there, we need more. We need to be able to meet people where they are. You know, I've, I've, I've heard from so many families since I started doing this that, you know, my family's experience, I was able to get treatment on the same day. So many families don't have that opportunity, whether it's because there's not a bed, there's nowhere close, Insurance is saying no, we can't afford it. All of these reasons that shouldn't be reasons that we stop somebody from getting help. And I think about if we think about this as a disease from a parent's perspective, from the healthcare system, if we bring this into mainstream medicine, and I know we've made progress in parity and it's gotten a lot better, but there's still a long way we need to go before we truly treat this like a chronic disease, like we would treat diabetes or cancer or anything else. And that's what we need to do. We don't shame people for diabetes. We don't shame people for cancer. You know, but, but with this disease, without anyone else shaming them, I can tell you from my experience, I felt so much shame internally that it didn't even matter what anybody else thought because I felt so horrible about who I was. So we just need to meet people with empathy and compassion and just love people, right? And I think that that's... It's really hard in this day and age with social media and all of the, the opportunity for people to just kind of spread hate. Um, but what I found is it doesn't matter who somebody is. If you get to sit next to them and talk to somebody face to face, you'll find common ground. And, and the disease of addiction is somewhere that I've found an incredible amount of common ground. Doesn't matter if it's you know politically what side. Doesn't matter where they're from, what they believe in. None of it matters. Everybody's been touched by this somehow, you know, and everybody needs to feel a little bit of that compassion. So thank you for letting me speak. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts, your feedback, any questions. Um, but Dot, I'm grateful. I'm grateful you're here. One of the things I didn't preface beforehand was, um, I don't know if I'll explain it correctly. So Harry and his mom wrote the book, and I encourage you, it's a great read, I encourage you all to read it, but they told their story simultaneously. So they made an outline of the topics they wanted to cover. So he wrote his version, 
and the mom wrote her version. And all of us as parents, we all, I mean, what would be the outcome? They didn't see the same story, did they? And I, I, did, I would just encourage you to read it, because that was really enlightening. And as a parent to adults, I could very much relate to what you yeah. said. So. Thank you. Hi. Um, at the beginning, you, you talked about um, how in high school you started drinking because you were feeling you know, this space where you didn't feel comfortable, some social anxiety. And I think that's probably very common, probably a very common reason kids in high school drink, because uh, the way it sort of lulls that feeling away. Um, so you sort of knowing what you know now, based on your experiences, what would you tell kids that are having those feelings in high school? Like, how else can they deal with those feelings? Like, what other things can they do? How can they go to parties and have fun and not let that <clears throat> social anxiety piece or awkwardness or whatever it might be um, get in the way of having some kind of a normal teenage experience? That's a, that's a really good question. I think something, if I could think back and sort of talk to myself, right? I, I know I felt alone in those feelings, but when you get older and you talk to other people who have been a teenager, we all kind of feel it. Right? There, everybody has this sense of, you know, whether you want to call it social anxiety. And it was something that I couldn't pinpoint. Right? I, I can only see it in hindsight. When I was in it, I felt like it was just me. You know, it was something that I heard that stuck out to me was somebody once said that it just felt like it defined me. That, you know, everybody else around me had this guidebook or this manual on how to, how to live and how life was supposed to go. And I felt like I didn't get it. You know, so if I'm, you know, if I'm talking to somebody who's younger, it's understand that we're all feeling that. And I found that, um, you know, one of the gifts through my recovery has been the opportunity to, to talk to people on a pretty deep level. But I know when I was 14, 15 and hanging out with, with my guy friends, we didn't talk about things that were uncomfortable. Um, you know, and, and I think... There's a lot of different reasons for that, but I think it's important that you find people, or at least find somebody, at least have one person that you can get honest with on a vulnerable level, because it doesn't have to be the whole group. You don't have to share everything with everybody, but you got to have at least somebody that you can just be fully transparent with, because I felt like I never had that. I never had one person that I could really open up to. Um, and had I had that, and I, I, I have those people today, and most of the time I, I get really vulnerable about something I feel so uncomfortable about, and they're like, yeah, I feel that too. You know, and I think that that's it's critical that we all have somebody that we can be really honest with, because um, then if something does start to go wrong too, they can help call us on it and check us. Another Irish Catholic here. So I have addiction through my family, and I spoke to my kids. They're now 19 and 21, so we kind of got through the crazy years. Um, but how do you balance consequences with education? Like you said, when you got suspended, it caused you to withdraw even more and hide. But you also don't want to let kids have a free pass. So whether you're parents or the police department, like how do you balance kind of that wanting to make sure the kid gets the help they need? But also, you know, they mess up. They do have some natural consequences. So yeah, I think consequences, uh, I always hate them when I get them, but, but they're important and, and they serve a real purpose. I think that what's, what's critical is that if we're recognizing that somebody might be struggling and the consequences are really maybe related to substance use or alcohol or some other thing that's deeper that's going on, that maybe we, you know, they get a consequence but we continue to kind of let them know that, hey, there's these other resources available, whatever they are, that could be just talk to somebody. And I think what's really important is that we let them know that there's no judgment if they take advantage of that. Um, because I felt like there was a lot of shame in, you know, asking for help. I was afraid to ask for help, you know, and, and I wish I had been presented sort of openly um, with, these are the things. And, and there was a long time that I was really hard headed and I wasn't going to listen. But I think the more that we just talk about what is out there um, 
and talk about it in a way where it's okay, right? It, you know, it's okay. We support it. We support you. We love you, but we just want what's best for you. Um, which as a parent, and my, my oldest is only 10 now, so she's, she's not there yet, but we're, you know, we have our moments. Um, I, I can, I'm starting to learn how hard it is with children, you know, to be able to sort of take the emotion out of it at times. Uh, but I think it's so important to just let them know that we, I love you no matter what. I'm not going to enable you. I'm not going to give you a free pass to, to do something that's going to be really detrimental. But if you need it, I'm going to help you get the help that you need. Um, and I think that it's just so important that we let them know that our hand is always out if they want or need any help. And what about like, you know, here it is springtime, lots of parties, graduation parties, your child's going off to a party. Do you have any tips for sort of how to navigate that? Do you wait up for them? Make sure you see them when they come in so you can see them and they know you're going to be up waiting. Or any tips like if they do see drinking at a party, how do you make it so the kid is comfortable talking to you and doesn't hide it? You know, that sort of thing. So that's a, that's a tough one because I haven't, my daughter's not like, if she's yeah. at a party, I'm not uh, super worried yet. Although, you know, but I think, um, I think there's some value in seeing them. I think there's, so my parents, I'll, I'll tell you this from my parents' side and how they did and what maybe worked or didn't work. So my mom was very much the really strict was trying to figure this out, um, sort of really in my business, you know, wanting to see me, wanting to call me, wanting to, to know what was going on. And my dad was sort of the complete opposite. He was like, hey, um, we want you to trust us. We're not going to overstep. You know, my dad actually used to tell me something that in hindsight, it it seems like great advice to give, but I never took him up on it. He used to tell me, like, if, if you're ever at a party, you're not comfortable or somebody's, you know, drinking and it's going to drive, just call me. We won't ever talk about it again. Um, you know, and, and so he had, he had tried to sort of put that hand out. And I think that was important. I never took him up on it because I felt like I was too far gone at that point, you know, because it wasn't drinking anymore. It was, I was using cocaine or something else. Um, but I think finding that, you know, finding a balance. We have to trust our kids to a certain extent, but that doesn't mean, you know, we're not still parenting them and, and watching them. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that because I don't have a lot of personal experience with it yet, but um, I do always, I always appreciated what my dad would sort of do with that. It's like, if you proactively reach out, not like I get a call because somebody's in trouble, if you proactively reach out, like we'll never talk about it again. And I always kind of figured we would talk about it again. I was worried about that. <laughs> if my mom found out, I know we would have. But um, it felt like a, a nice sort of safety net to have. Hi. Thank you for sharing this. And I hope this question doesn't come off horrible. But like, was your mom not up watching you come in? Did your mom not notice your uncle Kane or slurring your words to me? My parents from Ireland crazy, like they were watching. My father would be falling asleep, but they came in and they always wanted to give you a little hug. I didn't realize till later, like they were yeah. smelling. They were they they knew and they didn't have trackers. They just had the neighborhood people tracking you, like yeah. we have them on the phone now. I mean I'm listening, but I'm saying as a parent, it sounds like your parents weren't on top of some of this. Maybe maybe you think differently. Maybe I missed a little bit at the beginning, I'm sorry about baseball, but do you think your parents should have done something different? Or do you think had they, that maybe you wouldn't have gone down this path? I mean, you said your mom was all over it, but were your parents home when you came in at late, late yeah. night and coke? So, so my parents were. Uh, my mom specifically, she would wait up. She would want me to go in her room and say mm -hmm. goodnight. And I think, so there's, and this is- a good actor. Well, a, a good actor and, and <laughs> very uh, manipulative, <laughs> but, but I think there were two things, and I learned this from you know her writing in the book and sort of really going through it with her, so I, I feel like I can share it without assuming what she was doing. Um, one was that it was pretty slow and progressive, right? She was with me every day through that process. So, you know, what started out as not every day, 
and I was in the beginning probably a lot more cautious with like Visine in my eyes and all of these different things that try to mask the smell or eyes or whatever it was. Um, but it got to the point slowly with smoking pot at first really that I was just doing that every day. So I was sort of always that that was my baseline. Um, and she talks about it like if you don't see someone who's, you know, sick for a long time and then you go see them and it's so obvious uh, because that's something that came up was her friends would be like, what do you, do you not see what's going on here? Like it was so obvious to other people. Um, but she would try, she would drug test me. She would try all of these different things cause she was in a way trying to figure it out. And, and I think a big part of what we came back to was though she wanted so badly to figure it out. There was a ton of denial there. Um, that she didn't want it to be as bad as it was. She talked about one of her absolute closest friends came to her and was like, Harry's on drugs. Like it's, we know it, he's on drugs. Um, and her immediate response, and she had probably just drug tested me like that week, thinking it was drugs, but her immediate response was to be offended and like taken back. Like, how can you, you know, like don't say that about my son. So it was this combination of a slow, process that she was maybe too close to and then a really thick layer of denial. Thank you. But she yeah, I, I in hindsight I also I can't figure out how I wasn't sort of more blatantly caught. Um, other than I, I think denial can be really, really powerful. So drug testing didn't work? So drug testing, so what would happen was when sometimes she would, you know, and it would show up for, the only thing that I would usually fail for was pot, right? Because the way that the drug test happened in our house was there was this, this pressure and tension that would build to where I knew it was coming. Like I knew it was coming and I would start to I'd buy all the drinks from GNC or I'd drink a <laughs> bottle of vinegar or like do all of these horrific things to try to beat it. Um, or, you know, I would get somebody else's urine. I would do all, of, you know, whatever I could to beat it. But the problem was we would start battling and battling for day after day. And on like day four or five, six, that's when she would pull the drug test out. So like I knew it was coming. Um, so it was never sort of a surprise. So I always had time to prep for it. Mary, I love your story. Thank Absolutely you. love it. Do you ever speak to the kids, like high school kids? Uh, occasionally, from time to time. It's, so it's less, uh, I think, I've been getting more requests recently with COVID sort of yeah. easing up. Um, you know, so where I've, I did a lot of speaking uh, in the Philadelphia prison system sort of earlier in my recovery. That was something for me that was really important, an area that I could try to give back, which, um, you know, at times it's very uncomfortable because I'm there. I don't have a criminal record. Um, but at the same time, there's, you know, I, I often say I was treated, treated unfairly fair. You know, there, there's no, no question that I should have you know, um, wound up there. So that was really important, but, you know, I'd love the opportunity to speak to more, more high school students. Yeah. I think your story would really resonate with you yeah. because like, like I work here at the high school and I'm a retired drug and alcohol counselor. So like, I'm sorry if I was laughing at inappropriate moments in your story, but it just it brought me back to a whole other world that I absolutely <laughs> loved. Um, and the, the kids sound just like you did, like yeah. I can handle this. Yeah. This will not be a problem, you know? And, for the majority of kids while they're getting through high school, we don't become aware of the problem. But the problem is so deeply rooted by the time they leave here. It's, it's scary, yeah. you know, when you get them as young adults of treatment. Um, I am the punishment for drug and alcohol here at the high school. Um, so like a kid will get the suspension, but they also have to do six hours of conversation with me. Oh, great. Um, so we're tr we've been trying this for years, just to try to reach out so people do know there is help available. Um, I had two kids go through the high school and what helped me get my kids to the high school was when my daughter was like 10 in elementary school, 
we made a pa the parents of that grade level, so there were 90 kids at our particular elementary school. We knew that they'd grow up to middle school and then high school and not be friends. So you know. um, but we promised that we would honestly keep an eye on each other's children. And if we had concerns or we heard stories, like, you know, my kid would come home and if they thought they were in trouble, they'd trash somebody they went to elementary school with. Yeah. You know, if I believed that story to be true, you know, I'd give that kid's mother a call and say, remember our pact, no judgment. You need to know this is the rumor about your kid. And it worked for, for yeah. 90 families. We were able to do that and keep an eye on our kids with no one being the wiser. And I never caught any flack, and I didn't get flack when they called about mine. You know? So your great. kid's just the right age yeah. to make that pact. Yeah. It's not people you're going to be bumping into six years ago when you go out on the soccer field. You know? yeah. They're not going to hang out together. No, I love it. It makes me think of that. It takes a village. It does. Because uh, it really does. You know, and, and that's where, again, you know, my mom had that one friend tell her, but by then it was, right. it was way too late. Um, you know, but I love that idea. You know, it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mary, do you think you would have been an addict regardless of how your parents were? That's a hard question. I think I so, asked Brian that before, too. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, so I, it's a really hard question because yeah, it's pure speculation. Yeah. I almost think that I was sort of pre, you know, maybe in a really unusual circumstance had I not had the exposure. I mean, for me, the way that my body and mind reacted to like the first time that I experienced, you know, just having that altered state of mind with alcohol. Like, I can look back and know now that, like, my reaction to that was not at all normal. Like, the kids who did it with me, yeah, they had fun. They went back about their daily life. But for me, it was, like, immediately. I was on the school bus on Monday morning. Like, so are we planning? Like, what, when are we doing that again? Um, and it was just, like, that became my full focus. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I, I don't know to your question. Yeah. but. So you know, in, in hindsight, who knows? Because there could have been so many other psychological things along the line. That, yeah, because we want to figure out: yeah. are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the wrong thing? Are we trusting them too much? Are we, you know? Yeah. So. And it's an it's an impossible. I, yeah. With my kids, I'm terrified of. Yeah. <laughs> in some ways, didn't you just answer her question? Because you talked you talk about how um, it's you're not a, a bad person trying to be good. You're a sick person yeah. trying to get better. A person, you know, our bodies react different. Someone can right. get cancer from smoking yeah. and someone else doesn't. So I, I think, you know, nature versus nurture, but I really think, it, you know, addiction is, might be part of your DNA. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. certainly not yeah. something you want to go do or become. And I, and I think, you know, that, you know, like you said, that reaction is you couldn't help how you felt. And yeah. the other kids who might have done a line or hit off a bomb, they're like, yeah, whatever, and they'll walk away with it. I know... Growing up, I have friends who could pick up and put down coke, and others who it ruined them. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why. And it wasn't, you know, like you said, good parents, bad parents. It, it's just they had the ability to pick it up and put it down, and others don't. Um, I, I have a question. You said something very in the very beginning. You said um, your through recovery, you learned something about, and I, I'm going to quote you wrong, but. Um, as an addict, you would reach, or not as an addict, as a human, you would reach outside the drug or whatever to mask or help with something that was going wrong on the inside. So is that part of the, the key that we need to unlock is, and, and you might have talked about this too when you said, find someone who's like you, who can talk about you. Like you think you're alone and you're the only person who's feeling this anxiety or this misfit or this whatever. Um, I know in your book and because of who they are, you talked about like, you under the shadow of perfect pat, or you know, there, there, there's all kinds of dynamics going on in any family. Um, do you think that is there a way that we could get to that quicker and faster? Is there maybe with a program like fixing what's on the inside and not looking to drugs and alcohol or whatever to help? Is that yeah? I, I think it? I think I mean for me that's been critical, and I think so. Part of the interesting part of that is like. Again, when I put the drugs down, didn't immediately solve all my problems, you know, and that 
that tendency still existed. So I remember for me when I had a few months, you know, in recovery, then I started to, to put down on other things. Um, you know, the first one was, you know, if I can buy a house. And I remember I, I, in early recovery, I bought a house. And I was sitting in that house by myself, super uncomfortable and lonely, and feeling like that, that, that wasn't it. Right? But if I get this new job or if I get the girlfriend, you know, so it's, for me, it's been like a constant process of, mm-hmm. and, and it's, I'm not there because I'll still like, sometimes I'll go shopping, I'll buy things, I'll, I'll do things that are, you know, reach to sort of pull me out of myself that I have more Sweet. awareness yeah. to where I can <laughs> rein it in before I like sell all of my possessions and abandon my <laughs> children. But, um, but I think that, that I think for just everybody, whether it's substance use or not, I think in this day and age, and this is like I go on a whole other tangent about social media, but I think like you look at social media today and kids and, and that need for external approval and likes mm-hmm. and how many likes yeah. and you know, it's like that's a really dangerous mm-hmm. thing for people. Um because so much is based on that. And the other critical piece with social media is we're always looking at everybody's like best filtered, like their life looks amazing. Why are they always traveling? I don't understand. Like, like how do they, how do they afford it? You know? And then I look at like the things about myself that I don't like and compare like the worst parts of me to like this guy who's in, you know, Maui again. And I'm like, what happened? Um, but I, so I just think like that's not even a substance use thing. I think that's just like a, a human thing that, that we've all got to grapple with. And, and for me, it was more apparent because a substance use just like tore me apart really fast. But I think there's a lot of people who go through life who don't have that sort of extreme experience of substance use that, that are in that same past. Mm-hmm. And it's they're chasing the job. They're chasing something. Um, so I think just culturally, we need to be more aware of like looking internal. Um, for me, I think if I, if I sum it all up, what drugs gave me was a sense of peace. Um, and what recovery gives me when I'm like working on it and actively working on it is that same sense of peace. But I can still lose that in recovery and get caught up in, in things that are not what's in my best interest. Uh, but that's what I always chased, was that feeling of my mind would stop racing and I would stop focusing on everything around me and just was able to sit and be content. I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning. Did you play sports? I feel like the kids today, or a lot of the boys, are just so overscheduled and busy. But in a way, I have to say, they're up at baseball at 7 a.m. They, they keep me on over. Yeah. You're going to notice. But they are. Yeah. So I'm, sure <laughs> they are not. I'm saying, like, I think also they want to perform well. Yeah. So, you know, they know, like, oh, I have to go to bed early. I have to speak games tomorrow. Like, they're competitive, athletically, yeah. so they want to do well. I'm just thinking, you know, did you, was sports a big part of your life? And do you think that would have helped or not? Maybe I, not at all. I think there's value in whether it's sports or just having hobbies, you know, or things that you're passionate about. So I played a lot of sports in grade school. I got to high school. And so I went to this school, which is known for having a really good football team. And I I got to high school. I am not joking. I'm I'm in the 90s pound range. And all of a sudden I go out for the football team and I'm playing with guys that are like 250 pounds. Um, So that didn't last. So my football career imploded, unfortunately. But then once that happened, I, you know, I wrestled for that first year. But for me, what, what you're right about is, and this is probably a warning sign potentially was all of my extracurriculars by sophomore year in high school were gone. I, yeah, I dumped all of it to go, um, do other things. And, And another this maybe answers part of your other question also. Cause so the schedule at the high school that I went to, I went to high school in Philadelphia. I lived in the suburbs. Um, so a lot of people went to that high school. It wasn't super close. 
So you'd go on the bus in the morning, get on the bus like 7.30 in the morning. School was over at 2.10, but buses didn't leave to go home until 5.20. So I didn't get home till 6. So I had from 2.10 to 5.20 to run around Philadelphia. Um, and and nobody sort of just not have that accountability of where I was or what I was doing. So that, that yeah, that was a prime time death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, can I ask a question? And this can tap into both your personal and your professional. You know, growing up in the 80s, you know, obviously alcohol is since prohibition is already, has been, you know, legal. What do you think of the legalization of marijuana? And is it is it a gateway drug? Is it not? Like, so you've, you've been on both sides. I mean, you've, you've got your personal, you know, and then you also work in the, all these, re, in, in the recovery center. So you deal with these issues day in, day out. What, what's your opinion on the legalization? So I have, um, in a lot of ways, a really torn opinion on it. I think that um, it's so multifaceted. So it, I'll say from like my, my work in a treatment center, the number of teens especially that I see coming in that are, you know, in psychosis or, you know, that is, we have an adolescent program where I work. That's the number one primary substance is marijuana for adolescents. Um, and the number of them that are having severe other mental health challenges as a result of that is a, is a problem. I think for me, what I see is sort of some of the biggest challenges are one, the rush to legalization, I think in a lot of cases creates this false sense of safety. Um, and I think that that's a big problem. I think if you look at alcohol in particular, we talked about the op opioid overdose death toll, over 100,000. Alcohol kills another 100,000 every year. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and alcohol for our adult population is the number one mm -hmm. primary substance. Uh, and again, it sort of gets swept under the rug, rug because culturally it's so ingrained in our society. Um, and I think that there's a lot of risk with marijuana in terms of rushing to legalize. At the same time, I think that uh, I don't agree that, that people should be incarcerated over marijuana. I think that's a problem. But I think the, the benefit that I see to legalizing is, again, sort of back to budgeting, right? If we're using the tax money for real and effective prevention, education, and treatment, then there can be some positive, right? Because part of the, the real negatives are the black market, which creates crime, creates violence. It also creates more of an opportunity for it to be a gateway drug. Um, but I think we need to be really, really cautious in how we talk about this effort to legalize because it does create this sense of it's okay. I live in New Jersey. It's now fully as of, uh, they did it. And I don't know why they didn't do it on 420. They did it on 421. <laughs> on 421, you can just walk in a store and you can buy ounces of, of marijuana. And, you know, the, the tax revenue that they're anticipating is pretty immense. But it has to be used to really spread the education that this, there are real risks with this. And to put in money for prevention and treatment. And I think I'll wrap it up with this because it's I could talk about the marijuana thing forever um, but I think so much of you know what we talk about when we talk about substance use all the time is, is treatment 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 you know if we want to really make a change we have to do better prevention right again we've got 40 over 40 million people that meet criteria for a substance or alcohol use disorder that's the bigger problem right how do we try to curb that so that when, you know, I mean, my kids are almost too late for them, but like when I have grandkids, so that they're in a just different culture where that is not the case. Um, so I think we need to do so much more in prevention and oftentimes we wait and we look at the worst case scenario because that's the most urgent. We have to address that. We gotta find treatment for those people and there's not enough treatment, but we wanna make a real change. We've gotta change the way we think about 
substance use disorder, the way we talk about it, and the way that we try to prevent it. First of all, incredible, incredible job. Um, I think you know you were able to uh, articulate your story uh, in a really powerful way. Um, you know, this kind of pig really piggybacks on what you were talking about regarding alcohol. And, you know, I know a lot of people want to talk about, um, you know, adolescent substance use disorder. Uh, I work in treatment as well. And really what we've seen over the past couple of years, uh, especially on the heels of COVID, is a staggering number of first-time treatment seekers between the ages of 30 and 60 for alcohol. And, you know, if you're working remotely and, most of your meetings are held on Zoom. Sometimes that five o'clock hour comes earlier and earlier. And um, I guess my question would be, uh, you, you, you spoke uh, really well about uh, what you do as a community for the children uh, to make sure that uh, we're holding the children accountable. Uh, how do you hold other adults accountable in your community? And um, where do you see that going? So I mean, you're right, it's been so hard because the, the normal accountability has been work. You know, you go to work, you can't show up to work drunk, that's going to be noticeable. But when you work from home, you really take that out of the picture. And it's a lot easier to hide something or if you're having a, an extra rough day, you just turn off your camera. Or if you're on the Zoom, but you're, you know, just have it turned off. Uh, we've seen the same exact thing. The number of people that are coming in new and the number of people that... Um, are coming in that, that had clean time or sobriety, whatever you want to call it, that relapsed. And, and many of them had years, right? But because the, the supports that they had built, whether it was community meetings, wh whatever it was, um, all sort of disappeared. And, you know, I think a big part of it has to come back to family. I think another challenge with alcohol in particular is the way that we talk about it, address it, you go on social media, it's all these, like, uh, like TikTok moms are all, it's like wine o'clock all the time. That's how you're, you know, that's what they're promoting on social media. Um, you know, and I think we don't do a good job in talking about the risks of alcohol. Uh, but I think we need to, you know, if we start with our families and try to address it. One of the things, so my dad read the book. He drinks wine frequently. Uh, he got really nervous for himself. <laughs> so after he read the book, he like stopped drinking for like six months just to make sure he could. Um, but I think the more that we just have these conversations and, and normalize talking about, you know, alcohol use disorder and substance use disorder. And remember that like everything else, it's, it's on a curve, right? So there are people who are incredibly high functioning who struggle severely with alcohol use disorder. Um, and that doesn't make it okay. And usually it's in that dynamic where it's hardest to get someone into treatment. Um, and I, I'll just add to it, I think we've, we've seen an increase, and there's still not enough women that seek treatment. Um, women are usually the last to seek treatment because they're, you know, the mother, they're the sort of, they're there, they're the one keeping everything together in the household. So normalizing that it's okay for for women and moms and, and others to, to get help. But again, I think so much of it just comes back to normalizing the conversation in our culture. You know, if we want to talk about alcohol and have as many commercials as we do, let's talk about like, hey, if you run into a problem, like these are some of the resources. Because people don't, and this is where sometimes treatment can get a bad reputation, is people don't look into what they need until they're in absolute crisis mode. And then oftentimes they make a decision in a crisis that's maybe not the right fit um, or maybe not the right level of care. So if we're open about it, talk about it, let people know what's out there. If they do find themselves or a family member in a crisis, they might know where to go. Let me just add one thing on the um, education piece you guys are touching on. We stop tobacco use for the most part through education and through constant hammering of that message. As a society, we, we decided to do that. We haven't gotten there yet with alcohol or drugs. You see the ads on TV, my kids are watching them with the woman in the respirator saying this is because I smoked. 
and they immediately, why would anyone pick up a cigarette? It's anathema to them to think of that. We're not there yet with alcohol yeah. drugs. Yeah, and I think of that with cigarettes. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I remember like the restaurants, you go in smoking, non smoking mm -hmm. side, which side are you on? And it was all smoking because you're all in the same room. But um, I think for marijuana and everything else, it's, they made it so hard to smoke. And I used to smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. It was a big thing. I quit a couple years into recovery, but it got so inconvenient. Right. Um, Socially unacceptable. Yeah, so, I mean, you yeah. can't. You really felt too trash if yeah, you, you can't even smoke outside in most right. places. Right. So it's like, right. this is, you know, it became so inconvenient. And I think if we're looking at that with, um, you know, you got a long way to go on alcohol. Uh, but I think if we're looking with marijuana in particular, what does that look like? What does sort of legalization look like and those norms around it? Um, so I live in New Jersey and I work in Washington, D.C. So both of those places fully available, and you just smell it everywhere. Oh Absolutely and, everywhere. And there's no test for it. Like with alcohol, there's the blood alcohol breathalyzer. Yeah. Yeah. With... That's, That's a little scary. <laughs> well, yeah, we've got to do more of yeah. that education. Michael, I will key. send you the coalition's um, new brochure on women, women and alcohol. Yeah, I just want to give Dot a lot of credit for introducing we, we have a great that, campaign um, going on for that. wine, women, and wellness to our community. And uh, it's been a struggle, honestly. Because kind of like drug moms is like funny. Like it, yeah. it's there's mommy needs vodka. You know that Facebook Mom's page. Yes, yes, exactly. And um, you know she, she might COVID escalated it. Yes, oh, yeah. definitely, definitely. But it was brave of Dot to. Uh, We're not finished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're starting to to uh, to talk about that subject, but it's not been hard. judgmentally either. Just education. Just yeah. Put yeah. It out there. Well, Dot, I remember you said something once at one of those meetings, and my kids were really young, mm -hmm. and it stuck with me when you said, if you keep drinking every night at 5 o'clock in front of your kids while you're making dinner or while they're coming and going, and then you drive someone to a carpool, they see you doing that. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's really hard to then turn years. around to your 14, 15, 16-year-old son who's probably taller than you to say, you can't do that. That's right. right. And I, I'm, I'm glad you said it to me because the world does. That's true. I mean, you're their role model. Mm -hmm. So you talked a lot about the external things, and <clears throat> I always give Brian a lot of credit. Every holiday I reach out, I don't care if it's Columbus Day, I thank him for my recovery every day. <laughs> so, I was sick of it. so I think, that, well, let's, let's just say, Brian and Michael are both in recovery. They both had their own bouts with substance, right? Um, Michelle, I don't even remember Brian. Brian is someone we've watched the Air Force I remember. Over. Long time ago. Are you doing? I know. I feel older so, too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And then yeah, you know, Michael now has become involved okay, in the great. coalition as well. It the big thing I wanted to talk about was like eliminating, like when I came in, Brian did a good job of eliminating my excuses for me. I was looking for any reason to get out of recovery. Um, luckily enough, I took a lot of those away. I didn't have a career. I was homeless. I I didn't have a lot, but a lot of things I try to do for people in early recovery, even young kids, because there's a lot of reservations. Like some of these kids are coming in at 20, 21. They're not even legal enough to drink yet. Right. And part of my job too lately is like Brian taught me this, is trying to eliminate those excuses for them. Help these people with FMLA. Help them with maybe some poor things that they're going on. And as long as you take away those external things, I think it helps that person just focus strictly on their recovery. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for the family as well. Family is so, so important. Like it shouldn't be a mom or a dad's job to try to do the poor thing for them. Like they've already been through enough. Like they need support group therapies for them. And we get to tell them the same thing their parents have been telling them, but when I heard a different voice, it quit. I needed another alcoholic to tell me. It's about making the family's job easier and the person that's struggling, make their external life easier so they can focus on that one thing they're supposed to do. And I feel like you really did that in your life too. And I don't want people to have to go through what I went through. I shouldn't have to be homeless. Like I see these kids and it's hard to want them more than they do sometimes, but you know, I, I think long-term and plans that you go to treatment centers that have long-term plans. My 20 years of behavior wasn't going to be fixed in five days. Yeah. But once I got into the hands of the right people, these people like Brian gave me tools to use the rest of my life. I used to be so nervous about having to live in a church basement for the rest of my life. And my, my life is completely different today, like the ultimate freedom. But they gave me tools to act my way out of it. It's one thing to read a book, but if you don't apply that knowledge that you read in your book, what's the point? You know, in, in these places like Brian's house, like Michael's house, Liberty, 
they give you the tools and they give you actions to act your way into being a better person. And I think that's absolutely tremendous. And I feel like more people need to understand that. You know? Well but I appreciate it. Thank you. Very well said. Yeah, the, the one thing you said, which I didn't touch on and I, I usually do, is you talked about family. I mean, like, the just this is a family disease, you know, and, and it's, it's easy to, you know, for a family member to just put all the attention on the person who's struggling, but they need help too, you know. So where I work, we always say that the patient is the family and the family is the patient. Right, that you've got to try to heal that family system, and, and we talk about resources and what's available. It's critical that you know for parents, for loved ones, if it's your spouse, your parent, your kid, whatever it is, there's help for you too, you know, as a family member. And I think that so often, because a lot of times what we see is you you get one one person from the family, you put them in treatment. And you put them back into the exact same environment with the same patterns and the same way of thinking and all the same um, struggles, and, and it can oftentimes lead to a negative outcome. My mom always says that the family is like a mobile. You know, when one spin, spins out, the whole system goes with it. You know, so I think it's just critical that we, we deal with this for the whole family. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm so yeah. glad we got you here. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you get him back. Okay? Because I really would like you to speak to our student body. I'd love to. Anybody here that feels strongly after listening to his message may want to send a message to, you know, um, our principal, our superintendent, or somebody to say it was worthwhile and that we should continue. Continue the conversation. But the biggest thing for me is that. Well, you know, I wish we could have, my, my goal was to have an auditorium full of students during the day and an auditorium, not a library, but an auditorium full of parents in the evening to continue the conversation, the takeaway, what did the kids hear, what did you hear, and how can we bring it together. So it's, it's I'm all happy conversation. to come back anytime. <laughs> okay, that's good to What's the name of the book? So the book is, so we've got, uh, and I did a hard by publicist would be furious. Uh, the, so we wrote two books. Uh, there's an adult memoir, which is called Under Our Roof, and that's the one where it's both of our voices alternating within mm -hmm. each chapter, telling um, the same, same story, but very different stories. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then we also wrote a children's picture book called You Are Always Loved, which is aimed at, you know, really the, the idea was, for me, as the book was coming out, thinking of my daughter, and what conversations do I have with my daughter? Where it's, you know, it's bunnies. It's not talking about any of the harsh language, but it's talking about the feelings of, you know, I went away to treatment when my daughter was one, you know, and, and there was a sense of kind of abandonment that, that I felt. But, you know, it's just having those conversations of knowing that, you know, you're not alone. And, you know, as a parent who was struggling to tell my child that even though I didn't always show it, I always loved her. Uh, so there's two, Under Our Roof and You Are Always Loved. Okay, great. Definitely a good, a good read. Yeah. Very good read. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming this evening, too. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.